I didn't change the title, I'll just shorten it because it was too long. <laughs> so I'm going to stay in uh, basically in the same area and same region, Asia, um, and the collision zone between India and Asia. And I'm going to talk about um, the suture zone, the Indo in, in the India-Asia collision zone. And specifically, I'm going to look at processes following collision. And you probably may wonder why I'm actually talking at Top of Europe and whether or not there is anything that you may find interesting from this study. Well, maybe you can, can, you can use it as an analog for the, uh, for the collision zone, for example, in the Alps between um, Europe and Adria and see whether or not you can potentially see these kind of processes and mechanism that I'm talking about in, uh, in the Alps, for example. So collision zones in general um, are characterized by high topography and high elevation today, like Tibet and the Himalayas and the Alps. Uh, but when was some of the modern tonomorphic features were acquired is, is a question. So that's one of the questions I'm going to address uh, looking at, at the, the India-Asia collision zone and specifically when some of these topographic features that we see, high elevation uh, regions uh, in the collision zone, um, when that was acquired. And so we're going to look at two uh, studies areas. Um, I'm going to talk about the Kailas formation, which is an upper oligocene to lower Miocene formation, which is pretty regional and, and basically was deposited along the entire suture zone for over 500 kilometers from west to east. And then I'm going to move south and look at Mount, Mount Everest region. So even if you're not interested in, in the India-Asia collision, maybe you will be interested in at least looking at some pretty pictures of Mount Everest. Um, so here is Mount Kailas, and that's the, the, the type locality of the Kailas formation. Um, Mount Kailas is over 6,000 meter, actually 67, 14 meter. And just by standing and looking at, at that mountain, I was just taking that picture and I was wondering, well, obviously you see a lot of incision today, okay? Because you're, the peak is a six over almost 7,000 meter and you're standing at about 4,300 meters. So when was that incision, when did that happen and, and how does that relate to tectonics? Um, so now we're also, another interesting, so Kailas and Mount Kailas and these localities is also interesting because it serves as the headwaters of two major river system, the Brahmaputra that, that drains eastward and the, um, the Indus that drains westward. And actually some of the results that I'm going to show fit pretty well with what Yanni was talking about. And this is not staged actually, it just happens to be. Uh, so from a structural point of view, um, you're looking at again the India-Asia collision zone, which includes the uh, Yarlung, uh, Indus Yarlung suture zone. Um, the Kailas formation sits right here. Um, you are basically in the foothold of, of the great counter thrust, which puts the fork on top of the Kailas and is verging northward. So you're actually sitting on Gandhisi batholite rocks, Gandhisi arc. And again, you're looking at basically a, you know, a unit, a clastic deposit that is, is not just a localized little small uh, formation, is, is spanning again almost the entire length of the suture zone. Uh, and so is, is you know, the hypothesis is that it's telling us something significant about post-collisional processes. Okay, just briefly about the sedimentology. This has been published, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Is the Kailas formation is all continental. is a sandwich of different phases. You have the lower member, which is conglomeratic. The middle member, which is, I think, in my opinion, the most interesting one, um, is composed of, of uh, faces that indicate large deep lakes, probably warm and stratified. You have a lot of coal and a lot of fossils, a fauna that you don't find today, so you're probably looking at something that was a lake that was warmer, um, warm and, and probably lower elevation, or at least it's consi consistent with lower elevation and not 5,000 meter elevation as, as, as we have this, these rocks today. Um, exposed at the surface. And then the upper member is conglomeratic again. And you do ch see a change in source when you're looking at the provenance of these deposits, uh, suggesting um, a source from, uh, from the north in the Gandhisi arc in the lower member, and then you're shifting towards uh, the south with limestone quartzites and titanium Himalayan um, affinity rocks. So this is a photo of some of the faces from the member in the, the middle member, the Lacustrian. Uh, beds, and you can see there's a lot of fossils. They, um, we found a fish, turtle, crocodile tooth. So um, this is consistent with, again, as I said, a fauna uh, indicating a warm, 
let's warmer uh, climate condition and possibly low elevation. We don't have paleoaltimetry data because unfortunately those rocks have been cooked and so when you're looking at, for example, stable azotope geochemistry, that's all reset past the position. Now, so the model that is out there that has been proposed is that you have this basin that is associated with extensional tectonics where the Kailas formation was deposited, again, subsidence is related to, uh, to this formation of, uh, of an extensional basin associated with um, southward rollback of India under Asia. And that's published, and I'm just putting it there as a potential testing hypothesis. So now I'm going to shift and look at some new data that we just uh, published, and we're, I'm going to look to show you geochronology and thermochronology uh, from uh, the Kailas formation. And I'm going to concentrate on the apartheid fishing track um, uh, thermochronology system, which gives you basically ages that they're representing cooling through closure temperatures around 120 degrees C. And then I'm also going to look at some geochronological data, zircon uranium led geochronology and argon argon uh, on phlogopite, mostly to determine the depositional age of the deposit. Okay, so again, uranium led geochronology, we have seen that before, it can be used as provenance proxy or it can be used as an tool to constrain maximum depositional age when you don't have anything else to use. The idea being that your minimum uranium lead geochronological age um, has to be older than your dep depositional age. And then, again, um, the, the thermochronometers that I'm, that I'm going to use, mostly apatite fission track, but also some zircon uranium, thorium helium, and apatite uranium, thorium helium, uh, thermochronometers, they are giving you, again, cooling ages that represent the passage of that particular mineral through closure temperature in the order of 200 to 75 degrees C. So now, we often talk about exhumation, erosion, and tectonics, and, and I want to just stress that that's basically what we measure is a cooling agent that we make an assumption of how you, you do produce cooling. And a very effective way of cooling rocks through the surface is either by erosion, so removal of material from the surface, or by tectonic exhumation, by uplifting your foot wall if you have an extensional uh, if you're in an extensional regime, regime and you're looking at a normal fault. Okay, so these are, I'm going to, s to stay here a while because it's a complicated plot. Here you have ages on the y-axis in million year, and here you have different sample locations, um, basically from west to east. So those are all the samples we collected, mostly from Kailas uh, deposits. Again, those are Alis, upper Oligocene to lower Miocene uh, classic strata and some Gandhisi Bartlett uh, rocks. Actually, I'm going to go back. Um, so this great, and we also have um, uranium lead ages uh, from ashes actually intercalated within the Kailas formation, and some uh, argon argon and phlogopite from lava flows. So we, we can uh, constrain the depositional age of those deposits fairly well with geochronology. And so this line basically represents the depositional age of the samples that I'm plotting. And you can already see that all the ages are plotting below the depositional age of the Kairos formation, which suggests that um, you had to basically reset the system, meaning the fission track and the zirconelium systems. In this case, these are fission track ages. You have to reset the fission track system after deposition and cooling happen um, uh, after deposition, okay? Because those ages are younger. Uh, than the depositional age. So you need to have something, you, you need to have a mechanism that is going to first heat your deposits to get them at temperature greater than 120 degrees C and then cool them again, so exhume them. So the mean, and, and the interesting thing when I actually looked at this data set, and originally actually the plan was, the hypothesis, my original hypothesis was completely different. I was going to do detrital thermochronology and looking at different population coming from different sources and trying to figure out exhumation rates and so forth. But everything came out at the same, with the same age. And the thing is that basically along almost 500 kilometer along the suture zone, you get the same ages, which is pretty remarkable considering you're looking at the fish and drag system. And the mean uh, of those ages is, if you want to just take a mean and uh, generalize a little bit, is about 17 MA. Now, there are some outliers that can be explained by uh, extensional tectonics. Those are close to some of the domes in southern Tibet, and they, um, they actually are consistent with the timing of arc parallel extension, and a lot of people actually have worked on these rocks. 
Now we tried, and the next question is how much heating did these rocks experience, right? They were obviously hotter than 120 degrees, but maybe they were even warm, hotter than that. So we, we tried a, a warmer thermochronometer with a higher closure temperature. These are zircon uranium thermally images on um, some key samples that I, I selected. And you see that the zircon helium ages are sort of, um, they are not as cluster as the fission track ages. And you have the minimum ages basically agree with the fission track ages, but you also have older ages. And again, this suggests to me that basically the zircon helium ages are partially annealed. So you can bracket basically the temperature that the Kailas uh, samples experience to be greater than 120 and probably less than 200, or otherwise you will reset completely all the zircon helium ages as well and they will all cluster um, near to each other. Um, I also, for the, for, the thermo for the people that are experts in thermochronology, I did look at uranium concentra effective uranium concentration versus age and there is no relationship. So um, now this is a different way of plotting the data, basically you have age, versus temperature, so I use different thermochronometer and assign a closure temperature. Um, and basically this is showing you the same thing. It's almost like looking at an age elevation profile, but you have temperature on the y-axis. And it shows basically that all the samples under, un, underwent a, a very rapid um, episode of, of cooling uh, at 16 MA. And then maybe you have an increase of five, but uh, that's probably a speculation, a stretch. Um, so rapid cooling at 16 and uh, maybe some accelerated cooling at 5, I don't know. Uh, we did some thermal modeling as well using all the thermochronometers that we had and we basically have the same answer. 16 MA is where you basically have a clear cooling signature. So now to summarize, uh, you need to have 120 to 200 degrees C um, so 120 to 200 degrees C in 26 to 23 and underlying basement rocks of the Gandhisi Batholi requires heating after 23 MA. Okay, that's the top of the Kailas formation. And then fish, the, the thermocron ages require cooling at 17. Okay, so you need a mechanism to explain this. Or how do you do that? One way to heat up these deposits is by sediment burial. Okay, you can do that structurally, but I will argue, and we can discuss about that, but I will argue that there are not, uh, the Kailas is, is, is largely undeformed and there are no evidence for um, a GCT active at that time. But in any case, sediment burial is one of the, the easiest, I will say, explanation. But if you want to do that with sediment burial, then you need four to seven kilometer of a sedimentary pile, assuming obviously a geothermal grading, which we don't know, but it's kind of a back of the envelope calculation. And this will result in over eight kilometer of total sediment thickness, which means two millimeter per year accumulation rate in this basin, which is really high, which is however consistent with the model of uh, having this basin being um, extensional and, and short lived Now, how do you explain the cooling at 17? Um, one effective way of cooling rocks is by removing them from the surface. Um, and if you do that, that will require four to seven kilometers of material removed from the suture zone, maybe by erosion. That's a, obviously a way to do it. And so potentially a, dr a driver or a way to do that is by higher river efficiency of the, of the Paleo Yarlon River, put possibly associated with capture of the Brahmaputra. And Yanni was suggesting a capture by 18, so that actually works pretty well. So that's basically our next hypothesis, uh, or the preferred, I would say, interpretation of the data that, um, that the Paleo Yarlung River was incising the suture zone and uh, incision rates potentially increased due to the capture by the Brahmaputra. And if you want to do that by Paleo Yarlung River incision, then assuming a drainage system of 50 kilometers north to south in terms of width, which is the minimum, a 600 kilometer strike length, that's the length of the, of the, uh, of the Riarlon River today, and six vertical kilometer of rock removed, that's from thermochronology, you end up with over 18,000 square kilometer of sediment removed, which is equivalent to about 10% of the sediment volume preserved, for example, in the Bengal fan, which is a huge, you know, a significant contribution of the Bengal fan, if that's, you know, correct. Now, the other question is how regional is the 17MA signal? 
and what does that mean? So we're going to move south. So now we're looking at Mount Everest region. So this is Mount Everest. We actually were on the Tibetan side of the Mount Everest system, so on the northern side. And um, so we collected a age elevation transect near Mount Everest, not on the big one. Um, but it's fairly high. It goes from 5,100 uh, to 5,700 meter. Um, and those are uh, appetite fish and trachages, the, the red blobs. And again, you see that they're all basically the same age or within error, and they're 16 MA. And then I plotted existing ages, monazite uranium lead ages of dikes. It's plots at about 16 as well. Um, there is one argon argon uh, age on biotite from a, a loose cobble. It's right there. And then we have one sample for which we tried uranium term helium and apatites. And they sort of are consistent with the fish and track ages, but they are scattered. So this basically data set also suggests that you have an episodic fast cooling event at 16. And 16 is basically the, the timing of um, that people have suggested that it is the timing of activation of the STD or the South Tibetan detachment. Uh, so one interpretation for this, and actually I should say that we also ran some uranium led geochronology on zircons. Uh, from rims and cores, and some of the rims of the zir zircons end up to be 17 to 16. So you have obviously rims, they're zircon rims, that they are, they're formed basically at the same time. So one interpretation to have a uranium lead age that's 17 and, and fission track age is that they are 16 um, is by having tectonic exhumation and um, the compression melting associated with movement along the STD at this time. So now we can actually do more with thermochronology. Another approach that I use is to sample a river sand sample draining Mount Everest. So north is actually um, that way. Uh, this is the Mount Everest drainage system. The two glaciers that they're basically um, within the catchment of, of, the, of the river sand sample is the Rambuk, Rambuk Glacier, east and west. And so when you're actually taking a detrital sample, you're basically averaging out all the ages within a catchment. And people have actually used uh, detrital ages and ipsometry, meaning the proportion of a certain elevation within a catchment, um, as a way to uh, address where basically your ages within the catchment are coming from. So if you have, for example, an age ele elevation relationship, so you can assign to each elevation within a catchment a certain age, and then you can predict what sort of detrital ages you should be able to see within your river sand if erosion was uniform. So by comparing basically your detrital ages, the real measured detrital ages, with a predicted PDF or probability density functions of ages derived from the psometry plus the age elevation relationship, you can basically discuss where most of the, of the material comes from, which is interesting if you're interested in glacial erosion, for example. So this is the psometry of the, of the drainage. You have frequency on the y-axis and elevation on the x-axis. And this is the psometry of the drainage. And I'll show you that uh, our detrital ages basically suggest that most of the erosion and the material coming from um, the Everest uh, drainage uh, is focused on the lower side of the drainage, lower elevation, basically. So these are the data. We have um, appetite fishing track data, uh, 100 uh, analysis. Um, we have argon-argon ages, and that's basically, obviously, the peak. You can see is very the spike here is because the precision of the ages is much better than the appetite fishing track system. And so the argon-argon ages on white micas are uh, all clustering around 16 MA. The appetite fishing track ages, they also show a population of 15. Um, and the, this is the predicted AF PDF using hypsometry plus age elevation relationship using the appetite fishing track ages. And you can see that the two, although the shape of the, at least the major peak sort of mat matches pretty well, is shifted. And so it's not in the same position as you would expect if erosion was uniform. So one interpretation, you know, assuming that the system is doing the job and the technique is working and, and everything else, is that the interpretation of, of this shift is that most of the sediments are actually coming from the lower part of the catchment rather than being uniform. And that this interpretation is actually supported by the fact that if you actually look at um, 
hanging wall rocks of the STD, the ages, argon argon ages, are actually much older, and we don't see any older ages than 16. So it makes sense that most of the material is coming from the foot wall of the STD. Um, so now, an interesting comparison is that, okay, so those are all the data from the north side of Mount Everest, what I've shown you, there is a big spike at 16. This thermal model shows the same, uh, because basically that's what I put in there. Um, but if we actually look at the south side of Mount Everest, everything clustered around five, four. All the ages on the south side of Mount Everest are much, much younger. So we're actually looking at something that is obviously not related to STD movement, um, if we agree that STD movement is mostly 16. And it's probably what you're looking at here um, is, uh, and actually I forgot the reference, this is a Strulet paper in tectonics, so I apologize for that. Uh, those are not my data, they're published. Um, and their interpretation uh, is that basically what you're looking at is um, enhanced erosion possibly related to climate um, that is younger than five. Um, and, and what you're looking at here, in my opinion, this is a kink and is the partial annealing zone preserved at a certain a seven kilometer. But, and they actually suggest an alternative explanation for that, but I don't want to go into too much detail. So one of the, the model out there that has been proposed to explain what we see within the suture zone and is consistent with actually our data is that heating of the Kailas formation um, can be explained with burial and rapid basin subsidence during rollback between 26 and, um, and, uh, more, and greater than 17. So India is basically subducting northward and then rolling back towards the south and is actually creating an extension of the upper plate and um, the position of the Kaila basin, Kailas formation. And then exhumation at 17, 16 of the Kailas formation can be explained by basin inversion due to, potential, due to potentially return to, of, of heart collision, so India is still plan, you know, under trust in under Asia, and we can see that today, we can monitor it with, with uh, geophysics. And the, the fact that the quasi-coeval exhumation at Mount Everest around 16 on the north side of Mount Everest um, coincides with tectonic exhumation, the fact that they are coeval might suggest that you actually, the mechanism might be uh, linked, you know, there might be a, a common explanation for the two. Um, and so potentially under thrusting could also explain exhumation of Mount Everest and activation of the STD. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Question. Um, I have a couple of questions that may sound a little critical, so but don't take it badly. Um, <laughs> So first of all, your age elevation profile in the Himalaya is actually over a relatively short range of elevation. So, I mean, it doesn't make sense really. To extrapolate? Yeah. yeah. I agree. Okay. It's a kind of a fun game to play. <laughs> and it's sort of, you know, it was more of a test to see what we were going to get. And even, you know, I mean, I would argue that um, there is a fairly good match, even though the, the peaks are shifted, um, that, that maybe is not too bad to extrapolate those ages at different elevations because basically exhumation is so fast that, that it does extend. The other thing I should say is that there is an extra age in the yellow band, that is, which is much higher, just below the second STD sort of extensional detachment system. And that's uh, 15 plus minus three, and that's a zero confusion track age. Again, it's kind of this within error, so I agree there is not much of a slope. So that's a fair point, yeah. And the other question is that um, your hypsometric analysis assumes that all your rocks have the same amount of appetites. Yes. Is that true in your case? You um, so, no. <laughs> in fact, I would say that most of the appetites probably come from the lower um, part of the footwall of the STD versus the yellow band and, and, um, and the hanging wall rocks. So, uh, it's possible that, that, that what, you, what you see is a result of um, how much appetites there is in a specific rock. But uh, the fact that I think is actually telling us something significant is that the argon-argon ages from above the STD are much older and we don't see them. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, it, just as I found with the, with the previous discussion about the Nam Namchibawa, I, I, I'm yet to be convinced that drainage capture is going to 
in its own right, generate many kilometers of exhumation. And I find it even harder up at the uh, Mount Kailash region to consider that. And I just wonder why you don't take the, the, the back thrusting that might be associ associated with South Tibetan detachment. And I, mean, I, I realize Mount Kailash isn't, doesn't look deformed, but isn't it likely that that is associated with the timing of South Tibetan detachment? Certainly along in the west, you've got time equivalent back thrusting of, so the, of the time equivalent sediments of the Indus Malayas. <laughs> You're talking about the GCT, the great counter thrust that puts the fork on the top of the... Counter, yeah, is that... Is the that one that puts the fork on top of... Yeah, the great uh, counter thrust, so, yeah, well, exactly. So yeah. my argument there will be that if you have a thrust that puts fork on top of Kyla's rocks, that's going to actually overburden the rocks and you actually get a structural... I was imagining there's a detachment beneath Mount Kyla. She's saying there just isn't. It's just sitting there totally undeformed. Uh, there is no evidence for it, so... Yeah, maybe we can put one there, but I would say there is no evidence for it. Uh, very nice data, Barbara, and a nice talk. Thank you. Um, the 17 MA event is really, <laughs> is really, uh, is really exciting. I think we've been looking at uh, detrital, mostly detrital zircon fission track from the Siwaliks and from Western Nepal right into yeah. Arunachal. Over 50% of the zircon fission track ages are between 15 and 20 MA. So I think we're really looking at a at a pretty major event hmm. that's affecting the entire Himalaya yeah, I agree. at that time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I don't know yet how to put everything together, but yeah, I agree it's a big, something big is happening at that time. Yeah. Yes, Rob. Okay. Um, you seem to be suggesting that your data tell you that the, uh, the plateau was high, that the range was high prior to 20. Mm -hmm. uh, what aspect of your data uh, constrains that? Uh, I actually, those are, no, th those are not my data. I, I'm actually saying that based on an independent um, proxies that oh, okay. people so, have, have published. So which data convince so, you of that? Uh, yeah, paleo elevation proxies show that it was high by 35 MA, um, delta 18 values um, that basically show that you have values that are consistent with high elevation um, by 35. Um, an indirect sort of argument will be that our exhumation, we, we have another data set from Tibet proper, not southern Tibet, so the inter, inter, in, internally drained part of Tibet, show that most of the exhumation of Tibet was uh, about 55 to 60 MA, and so we argue that that is um, consistent with a high elevation even at collision, basically, because you're looking at uh, assemblages of terrain that they were, they collided pre-collision with, with um, uh, with India, so you know, it's thinking that that was a, a zero sea level before India came in. It's unrealistic, but yeah, it's it's a set of data set that show that basically uh, that the plateau was high by 35. Okay. Um, Thank yeah. you. That is not actually that is independent from what I've what I've shown. Uh, yeah, behind you. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the, about the mechanism that you invoke to explain uh, uh, this event, the, uh, the uplift event, uh, you're mentioning the, uh, the rollback of the slab. Uh, I wanted to say that the, uh, the, this rollback of the Indian slab is actually not really active in the sense that it's not rolling back just under its own buoyancy, but it's, rolling, it's being folded backwards because India is stepping over it. So, mm -hmm. so it's not going to cause a deflection for for that reason. However, uh, a mechanism that is based on dynamic topography is, is, is a real good alternative, and if you're interested, you should come to my poster. <laughs> <laughs> I did see your poster. Um, I would say that, and perhaps it's a combination of both. I mean, that's just a model and an idea that I throw out there. But uh, you know, if it's true that you need about eight kilometer of a sediment pile, I find it difficult to explain it with dynamic topography, but you know, we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> We well, can I agree do that. that you know the rollback is is related to the fact that India is coming in fast and and so is basically you know rolling back because of that. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, on that note, perhaps. Uh